The North Carolina Tar Heels are loading up in the class of 2024, most recently with Ian Jackson, already the fourth commit in the class. But Hubert Davis is apparently not done. Might Jaron Stevenson round out a nice quintet for the Tar Heels? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Thursday, January 26th, 2023. Welcome in to the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade. Joining me right now is our guy, Jason Jordan. Joining us later in the show will be our other college recruiting insider, Mr. John Garcia Jr. I want to thank you for making Locked on Tar Heels listener watch every single day. By the way, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. And while we're getting ready to talk with Jason, we would like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college basketball recruiting sponsor across the Locked On network. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. All right, Jason, the class of 2024 for the North Carolina Tar Heels, Drake Powell, Elliot Cadeau, James Brown. And as we said, just last week, Ian Jackson in that in that flip at the last minute that made you and I record a second late <laughs> night episode. Now, specifically talking just high school players, obviously we won't know more about potential transfer portal things until, you know, we get closer to this. Before we get into Jaron Stevenson himself, give me an argument for adding a fifth high school player to this class. Well, <clears throat> the well, I'd have to I'd have to talk about Jaron Stevenson for okay, the argument it. for because it. it seems like they have the inside track. And I think he's a very talented player, a guy who can do a lot of multiple things on the court, on both ends of the court. And I think um, you know, he can we'll get into what he can do later. But I think if you have the inside track on a really talented player, I think you have to take that player. Um, so that would be my argument for taking him um because he's, you know. He's an elite talent, like uh, McDonald's All-American level talent. So if that guy wants to come, uh, forget that transfer portal. You got to go ahead and grab him. Yes. It, it, oh, I don't know, Jaron. Maybe, maybe just go somewhere else. Yeah, right. you, you're not, you're not uh, shooing him out the door. Not only because that would no. not be great for him, but it would be bad long term in the recruiting game. Yeah. For kids talk. Jason, give me an argument against, let's say it's not Jaron Stevenson. It's just right. rando college or high school right now, junior. Give me an argument against adding a fifth high school player to this class. Well, the argument against would be um, so you can hold out for like the top, a top five transfer portal guy, uh, which would, would give you the benefit of experience, obviously. Um, but let's say it is Jaron Stevenson. You're like, man, but we got talent. We just we want some experience in that class. Um, that I understand too. Obviously, that has worked out well, specifically for North Carolina. Um, so you know, experience matters, and you get a proven guy from the portal who has um, put up, you know, who has produced at the level that you're at. Maybe not the exact level, but in the college game, he's putting up numbers, and they're not taking nobody that's not a top tier um, based off their history their short history in the world of <laughs> transfer <laughs> yes. portal world that we are uh, newly in, but in their short history, they are taking savages. So, um, you know, it, I'd have to believe that, that, that they could get their pick of the litter in the transfer portal based off what their needs would be. So, um, you know, the experience factor, I completely, um, I completely understand that. And I probably would lean toward that. And, and to your good point there, I think this is something, a paradigm shift that a lot of people need to make, myself included, if we're being honest. When we talk about a team's, like if we're talking about the class of 2024 for North Carolina, I think everyone's brains at this point still go to, oh, the high school commitments. We right. need to think about a class now in its totality, meaning yeah. high school seniors coming in that, that fall or whatever, 
as well as those in the transfer portal class. Obviously, there's some yeah. ways in which you think of them as two individual entities, but all under the umbrella, in this case, of the class of 2024. Is yeah. that an appropriate way to begin thinking about recruiting classes? Absolutely. When I was in uh, this summer, you know, when it was still new, and, and it's still new now, you know, the portal, getting used to that. That is, to your point, that is the way that you're going to have to start looking at the recruiting class you almost have to be like, okay, we got our two five stars. All right, so I wonder if we're going to get in the portal, man. I guess we got to wait till what is it, it's at the day after selection Sunday is when they can start jumping <laughs> yeah, in. That's when it opens so, up. Um, yeah. And then as teams get bounced in the tournament, the next day it's like, yeah, I'm leaving, right? Um, so you'll see a lot of that this year. But, um, yeah, that's that. you have to reprogram your mind. I had so many coaches tell me, um, you know, the day of the four-man class, and, you know, not – present company notwithstanding <laughs> it's over right um they're always going to hold out for one or two spots in the portal so um that was the i mean probably 10 coaches told me that at peach jam alone um so they were saying it in regards to telling 24 kids you better go ahead and commit you know because you're not going to have all the spots that you used to have uh, in the past and i think that if you look at um the way classes by and large, uh, classes are being formulated. That's hope, that's held true, true to form. What's interesting about that to me is what does that do to the late bloomer? Does it yeah. send the late bloomer to a mid major? Does it send bloomer to a lower tier high major? Does it? Yeah, I mean, maybe that's like there there is a high major who just happened to have a spot left over. And so that that's something interesting that we're going to have to keep an eye on across the yeah. college recruiting landscape. But, yeah. Jason, what I want to do is get specifically into Jaron Stevenson e ever since the Ian Jackson commitment went through. Honestly, ever since the Elliott Cadeau and James Brown's commitments yeah. have gone through and Carolina had three. It's like, man, that's like one at three different positions. I wonder if Carolina could basically pull off a starting five out of the class of 24. And when you add in Ian Jackson, it's still on track to do that. And Jaron Stevenson would round that out. And Carolina fans are all in the mentions on Twitter, all looking at Jaron Stevenson. A lot of people want Trenton Flowers. Obviously, they're not going to get both of these guys. Right. What is it about Jaron Stevenson's game that would be the guy that you would want? So, you know, he he does a couple more things than Trenton. And then, you know, Trenton kind of almost fills the role of an Ian Jackson or Drake. I mean, no disrespect to Drake Powell, but, I, you know, he's a higher tier, right. you know, recruit. We all know that, right? That, so, that is what it is, yes. But he fills that role, whereas, you know, Jaron Stevenson does, you know, multiple things that those guys don't do. I mean, first of all, he's 6'9". <laughs> you know, let's start with that. So he's a, he's already taller you, than them, you cannot right? teach yourself to be six Can't, nine. I, I've tried it, man. I really tried it. I, you know, I've meditated, it's not working. <laughs> so, um, but really active rebounder. I think you know he brings that energy. So really active rebounder. He's a guy who can get the rebound and push it. Um, you know, which is definitely in line with uh, Hubert Davis's style of play. He can knock down the perimeter jump shots. He's good off the dribble. You know, he blocks shots. Just brings uh, energy, energy, energy on both ends of the court. And so that tends to fill up the stat sheet. And, um, you know, and then he obviously scores in the paint. So he can be like a um, stretch four. Jump shot is improving. But I definitely think I could see him in a stretch four role. And, you know, with the way uh, Hubert Davis has run his personnel, especially, well, especially over the last two years of him being a coach, <laughs> um, you know, I think he would fit in well in that system, especially with the personnel that they'd be bringing in in that class. And it seems like from that description, outside of the shooting touch being as strong, it, it, he sounds very Jalen Washington-y. Yeah, yeah, in a way, in a way, I think he's, I think he's a little bit more active. Um, okay, you know, so not uh, as good a shooter, more active. Right, right, right. I would that, yeah, I would say that, I, I, and in, and in that regard. I, now we got to remember Jalen didn't play for like a year and exactly. a half. Exactly. You know, so sure. um, I I saw more of Jaron, and you know he's he's a stat stuffer. Like so he, mm. and I think he's probably a better defender. You know, because uh, he can guard multiple positions, and you know he's got great timing on the shot. I mean, he averaged four blocks a <laughs> four blocks a game this season to go with twenty one and I think around eleven or twelve uh, points a game. So. Um, 
yeah, just more productive uh, based off what I've seen and uh, a better defender timing wise for sure. And and a true rim protector like that is something that Carolina has not yeah. had in some time. And so we'll have to keep our eyes on the possibility of that. Well, we do want to keep talking about Jaron Stevenson, his recruitment, and a couple other things about his game. But before we get there, I need to tell you that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel is our brand new sponsor here on the Locked On Network, and the NFL playoffs are here. And so, of course, that makes us really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they are the number one sports book in America. And if you're new to FanDuel, even better, they have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. New customers join today to get started with $150. Jason, I would like $150 free dollars in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. And you can even combine your bets for a chance at an even bigger payout with the same game parlay. They've already got the lines up for this weekend's NFL Conference Championship games. The Eagles by two and a half over the 49ers in the NFC and the Chiefs by one and a half over the Bengals in the AFC. All of this on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So football fans, do not miss out. Place your first $5 bet to get $150 in free bets, win or lose at fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Jason, who are, are, are you a football guy? Are, are you watching these uh, NFL championship games this weekend? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was not, I was not upset that the Cowboys lost. I, <laughs> I was not. Um, so, yeah, so there's that. Um, but uh, I, am, I, am, I am watching and I'm pulling for the 49ers. All right, 49ers. For sure. What about in the AFC, Chiefs or Bengals? Chiefs, because I want to see the 49ers and the Chiefs. Oh, that would be a matchup. And ho- hopefully Patrick Mahomes will be re- – Who do you yeah. have a, a specific team or you just like watching football? Well, see, I don't – you know, I don't I don't like to say this um, on the record, but since you put me on the spot, okay. I am a Carolina Panthers fan. Okay. Um, <laughs> long-suffering Carolina <laughs> Panthers fan. Yes. So, um, so there's oh. that. Yeah, there's well, my trauma for today. Listen, I am a fellow NFC South sufferer. I grew up in Atlanta, so I'm a Falcons fan. Still reeling from 28 to three. So uh, maybe maybe we can commiserate over that. Jason, let's get back into talking about Jaron Stevenson here. Um, Let's unpack his recruitment a little bit. From from what I can tell, he has at this point six offers on the table. In addition to North Carolina, Georgetown, Mizzou, and then uh, just a whole bunch of schools right here in this same area, NC State, Virginia, and Wake Forest. No, no, no Duke offer as of the time of this recording. Right. So yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, yeah, spot on. Yeah, spot on. I think he's only taken an official to Georgetown and maybe, maybe last I heard he was going to Missouri this month. Yes, uh, Georgetown visit back on December 3rd. Now, yeah. obviously, when, when you look at this, for a kid that's from North Carolina, Georgetown, Mizzou are the outliers. Do you see them as real competitors in this thing, or, or does it seem like amongst that like Virginia, NC State, Wake Forest, North Carolina crowd, he will probably most likely stay there in the ACC? So I've heard there's a Georgetown tie. I hadn't pinned down exactly what it is, um, but I know that they're, um, they're a contender for for sure. Um, I think everybody at this point, I know he's looking at everybody, but I mean, back channel, I think Georgetown is a real contender, which is kind of interesting because they're, just they're not doing very well. Yeah. Oh, poor uh, Pat Ewing, man. Oh, I hate he, it. You know, I just wonder if he's going to be there. Jerry, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, so. And that factors in for sure. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, I, everybody, I'm sure everybody's heard that Carolina seems to be the team to beat um, for him. So, um, I'm curious to see when uh, he takes an official. I know he's been there multiple times. And, right. I mean, it is in his backyard, but, you know, the there's a family connection. is different. Um, as we have seen, the visit can change the world. <laughs> and sometimes it can, uh, and I always say that, but sometimes it can just, it can like, uh, you know, stamp, you know, that it is over, you know. Uh, and so that's what you guys, I imagine, would want to do on an official visit. So I would say those two, um, from what I've heard and what I've, 
talk to people about. Those two are the top contenders um, as of right now. As of right now, right. And obviously, as we well know, things can change yeah. in a quick hurry sometimes. Anything that you've heard yet on a timeline uh, uh, to expect here with Jerrion Stevenson? The last I heard, and this was at least a week ago, um, was that it was going to be after the season, um, that he was going to take a couple more visits. Um, but, you know, <laughs> as <laughs> um, as Ian uh, taught us, uh, you know, <laughs> I've learned for decade, more than a decade, you never jump out the window for these kids. You know, <laughs> they will make you look certainly really? very, very unsmart. I'll say it like that. Um, so, but, you know, I think, him being younger and, you know, I, I could see the, I could, that would make sense for the spring. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll look for that sort of timeline for now. We're not going to hold you to that, Jer uh, Jason. We won't hold you personally culpable if, if that is not the actual timeline. Uh, but it's just good to have something of yeah. an idea. <laughs> now that said, you know, you got to think about what we talked about. Now we got four, Jaren, and then this is be this will be my pitch. Now we got four, you know, and I don't know if you know this, but after Selection Sunday is when we can populate the portal. So then we're going to be able to see what we can really get. I mean, do you really want me to wait to see what I can really get? You see, because if I'm here, I'd be like, you see what I'm bringing in. You know, I'm bringing in Brady. I'm bringing in Pete. You know, I'm bringing in those guys, guys that are going to put yep. up numbers immediately. Yep. yep. So From that you, know, same you might want to think about that. that. You're playing. That exactly. Because I'm looking for a guy like you. Now, you could, I could have you, or I could go get the experienced guy that I know will produce. Um, so that would be my sale, you know, and then I would mask him. Like, but I'm not trying to give you any pressure. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no pressure. Like, I would never do that. Just something to think about. Yes. So and, and if not, he pops, then that sale won out. I'm sure that's the sale because yes. Cupid is quite smart. And not to mention, as we've talked about with others of these guys, like, hey, also, come be here where Elliot Cadeau is going to get you the ball in the right spot to do what you need to do because he is a pass-first playmaking yeah. point guard. That yeah. cannot be overlooked or undersold. Yes, completely agree with that. One thing we haven't talked about yet with Jaron Stevenson is, is we mentioned at the end of the, the first segment there, some of what he's really good at, that the defense and the activity on both ends of the ball, getting out and pushing, developing his shot. What what at this point in his game would you like to still see continue to grow to make him the best version of himself as a college basketball player? Yeah, well, the first thing that would jump out to me is his jump shot. Like where I say he can knock it down is not automatic. Like so it's not – but it's gotten better even over the last uh, – since the summer. I think it's gotten better. So um, there's improvement there because he's a worker. So I would say that would be something. Then I ball handling at 6'9", it's to the point where, like I said, he could push it, but um, to be able to create off the dribble from the wing, you know, in the half court set, you know, that's a, that's a different type of skill set. You know what I'm saying? So a point forward. He is not, he is not, no, 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 <laughs> but he can push it. You know, I'm not saying you're going to take it from him. I'm just not saying you're not going to take it. <laughs> so, you know, he could tighten the, the handle up a little bit more. And I've, I've, I think he said that for, for months, you know, I mean, he was certainly saying it in the summer. So I'm he's aware of these things. Like he's not like a diva, like where he's, he's arrived. He's not that he's not, doesn't seem to be wired that way. So that's a great thing. And that, that just speaks to the caliber of person that Hubert Davis is going to get. He will not settle for someone who is not that. It's just not. Yeah. I don't think that's in his makeup as a human being. And Absolutely. so just another potentially high character person coming to be part of the North Carolina program. Jason Jordan, great stuff. Thank you so much. Coming up, folks, we are going to talk to John Garcia Jr., Interestingly enough, not about Carolina's incoming high school class, but about some transfers coming in to Chapel Hill. We move now from basketball recruiting to football recruiting. We're also moving from high school recruiting now to the transfer portal, recruiting in football. And joining us to help do that is our guy, John Garcia Jr. And by the way, we'd like to thank LinkedIn for being the official football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On Network. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. 
Post your job free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. John, great to have you. Last week, we talked about some of Carolina's wide receiver transfers coming in. In order for Drake May to have time to get the ball to those dudes, he needs some guys up front blocking for him, especially losing a big, big, vast majority of last year's offensive line. So to help stem that tide, Carolina brings in from Coastal Carolina, Willie Lampkin. And let's talk about Mr. Willie Lampkin today. Yeah, absolutely. A guy that's incredibly easy to root for. Undersized, undervalued out of high school, even though he came from one of the best high schools really in the country, Lakeland High School in Florida, state championships to his name, a wrestling state championship to his name. So many things that profile so well, but, you know, he was probably 5'11", 6 foot, 260. So it kind of was what it was on the recruiting trail. But how about a kid who bets on himself, goes to Coastal amid their rise, grabs some all-conference honors, and and then makes the move up to the Power Five, the, the realm where a, a lot of people pushed back on, on his ambition against. So, Really cool story just in that sort of trajectory, but obviously a very, very good high, high floor football player on top of it. A true modern movement center that is going to allow this offense to stay balanced, stay multiple and and keep defenses guessing because he can do some things that most centers simply can't. It's actually the benefit of maybe being undersized and more athletic. So he's fascinating. What? What? Let's keep going with that, John. What are some of those things he is capable of that maybe bigger, less mobile by mobile guys can't do? It's the movement. Uh, whether you need a linebacker, um, you know, at the at the the contact point to be cut off, whether you need to run a screen, whether you need to get uh, just blockers out in space in general, he not only has that experience, he's has he has proven experience in getting out in space and and doing big damage uh, for your running game or your passing game, depending. So uh, it's really the footwork. Uh, It is elite. He's incredibly quick. Uh, He doesn't sacrifice bad snaps in that process at Coastal. They ran some funky things on offense. I think everybody knows that at this point, a lot of gun, a lot of pistol, uh, a lot of misdirection, a lot of stuff that enables them with maybe less size and or talent to, to, trim the margins and that's part of the reason why they won so many games over the last few years and Lampkin at the center of all of it uh, literally and figuratively has been a a big reason why so he enables you to move Uh, he enables you to move the pocket to protect Drake as, as that new offensive line comes together and then from a running perspective my gosh he gives you so much ability to reach block, to pull, to kick out, to get to the second level and become a kind of a menace uh, on early down. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to like in the floor of, of what Willie Lampkin's going to bring to the table and it's going to help this, this Carolina rushing attack stay, uh, you know, really important and critical in this offensive coordinator transition. What, what's interesting with that is even though this year had so many accolades as being a center, if, if I remember correctly, it was the Sunbelt offensive lineman of the year. He switched positions last last offseason after playing guard. Um, and like that'll be part of the question this year because Corey Gaynor, who had transferred from Miami, announced he's coming back, played center for Carolina all of this year. So obviously probably have some competition there, but um, I I know with that undersized, he probably can't go out to tackle, but might we see him move out to one of the guard spots or, or do you think you really compete at center first and then move him out from there? I think he wants to compete at center first because if this this great sort of underdog story is going to continue at the highest level. Center is going to have to be the main part of that conversation, if, if anything. Uh, but look, uh, he's got the guard experience. And again, some of those same qualities we just detailed as a great center makes you a great guard as well. In fact, when you talk about pass protection and some of these zone specific schemes, the guards are moving more than, than we've really mm-hmm. ever seen. So mm-hmm. in that light, in a modern type offense, uh, it, it's still going to be just as important important with those movement skills. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how it works out between him and Gaynor. Obviously, guys coming from from different um, <laughs> avenues to get to Carolina. Yeah. Um, but it's a good problem to have if you feel good about one and two 
at the center position, you're, you're in a good place. And look, you also have value if you're Lampkin for that versatility, because look, O-line units rarely look the same in fall camp compared to bowl season, right? There's always some movement. Some guys have to sacrifice something positionally or schematically to make it work. Uh, so the more guys you have that can do more than one thing, uh, the better off you're going to be long-term. So there's probably a scenario where Lampkin plays multiple positions anyway, on this 2023 Carolina O-line, but you're not leaving all conference upward trajectory, coastal Carolina to sit at North Carolina. So I think that's the most important part here. Yeah. Let's not forget coastal Carolina is not some also ran. They are a major, major player in the FBS and, and from Miami and coastal Carolina, uh, Carolina bringing in all these beach dudes to the offensive line. Let's <laughs> chill out and get some Hawaiian shirts on these fellas. Now, uh, John, I want to go back to something you talked about that, that I love to have a conversation about is you talked about how high his floor is. A lot of people often have this conversation like with fantasy football, right? You're looking for these low risk guys who have a high floor Sometimes you want to you want to project out to the higher ceiling, but you feel really comfortable if it's like, man, I know this dude's going to get me 15 points a game a week in fantasy, right? Why is that important on the offensive line? And would you rather have a high floor with a little bit lower ceiling than somebody whose floor you're uncertain of, but might have a potential higher ceiling? That's a great question, Isaac. I'll start with uh, the former. Look, when you are look naturally lower to the ground because you're a little bit shorter <laughs> you're you're a wrestling champion you're a guy who who leverage is going to be your best friend low man wins right that's still a principle in college football but you combine it with his athleticism and his lower body strength and that wrestling background there, there's a lot of grit to, to this kid as well it's not mm -hmm. like he's just one who is like a basketball player setting great screens He's the basketball player that sets the screen that puts the defender on the deck and it's a borderline flagrant. You know, this is a mean, a mean cuss, as they say in some parts of this country. So uh, I think all of those traits combined with that natural leverage and lower plane that he plays on is always going to enable you to see the field successfully, even though, yeah, it doesn't project to the NFL. It doesn't project to tackle. It doesn't project to certain things, but we do know, hey, your run game just got a whole lot better and your ability to pass protect just got a whole lot better with, with Lampkin on board. And, and for me, to answer your other question, Isaac, I'm, I'm more of a floor guy. I've always been, and maybe it's the journalism instinct in me to, to value that, but I, I think there's something to be said for knowing what you got and then improving upon strengths. I think in the evaluation business, and, and I fall victim to this too, we get lost in the, well, what, what doesn't he have that he can acquire department, which is great. And, and it, it turns these things around, but there should be more emphasis on not only the floor, but enhancing those strengths. So if Willie Lampkin brings you great leverage, discipline, and lower body ability, let him get stronger in the lower body to enhance that obvious strength, as opposed to focusing on the areas where maybe he doesn't check boxes like from a length standpoint, maybe a pass pro technicality standpoint or an edge standpoint. Let's focus on the strengths, the high floor and enhancing those elements to be that much better. Um, it, it's just like a, a college football philosophical question, right? Do you like watching the Utahs, the Michigans of the world, or is it more about the schools that are, are flashes like TCU this past year that maybe doesn't get there every year, but man, when it clicks and these guys hit their ceiling, then go all the way to the national title game. And, and there's really no right or wrong answer in, in that department. For me, though, I would take the consistent school. Give me Utah and a bunch of Pac-12 titles and a bunch of guys who are going to be tough and play great defense over the once every however many years great team because all of the stars align. Let's win games even when we don't bring our A game per se. And I think that's the type of thing you get with high floor players. And certainly Willie Lampkin is one of them. Which is so important in the transfer portal NIL era and all the variability that comes along with that, man. If we can create that consistent foundation and floor, you're putting yourself in a great position to win consistently annually. So, John, really appreciate you unpacking all that philosophical side of things. Well, Carolina will be under the direction of a new offensive line coach, Randy Clements, and the whole offense under Chip Lindsey. We will wait to see how this thing unpacks. John Garcia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.
That's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Thanks so much to Jason Jordan and John Garcia Jr. for joining us. These guys are so good at what they do, and that's why we get to have the privilege of having them on. I hope you appreciate all their good work. Make sure to go give both of them a follow on Twitter. You can also follow our show at Locked on Heels and me at Isaac Shade. Been getting a lot of emails lately. I love it. Thank you so much. It's great to be able to interact in that way with you. Locked on Tar Heels at gmail.com. Keep them coming, especially because coming up on tomorrow's show, we have a mailbag episode. Uh, just about ready to record that here in the next little bit. So if you're still looking to get a question in, please do so. If you get one in late, I'll just hold it and we'll get to it on the next time we do one of those. Please don't forget to subscribe to the show, smash the like button, and leave some comments on your thoughts on Jaron Stevenson and Willie Lampkin as well. Make sure you check out Locked On's brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, hosted by yours truly and Andy Patton. We bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, you can hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. Thanks so much for hanging out with me on a Thursday, talking some Carolina recruiting, basketball, and football. It's a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, peace. <laughs>